nation, Father, that has ignored the spiritual side of our life. We've done well in material and we've done well in, in physical. But we're lacking, Father, in the spiritual part. The church has failed in many ways to establish the Christians in a momentum spiritually for the will and work of God. I pray for us, Father, as a congregation, that we would take the seriousness of the virus for a spiritual awakening within our own souls to what is the purpose of the church. What's the purpose? What's, what's the purpose, for example, of being an ambassador for Christ to the world? What's the purpose of being a priest, part of a priesthood to the church? All of these things, Father, are very important for us. We've got to find our balance. We're the custodians of the word of God and evangelism, and we've got to find our balance within our own church. I pray today as we look at another episode in the life of Elijah uh, that came as a result of the great victory on Mount Carmel, you would help us understand some great truths about our life today as we fight within this virus, a spiritual war, an invisible war. It's not invisible to those of us that have the word of God and the ministry of the spirit in our life because we can see it clearly. But how are we going to be able to tell others about it? And give us wisdom, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to welcome you to the 930 for those who are visiting with us on the Internet. On Sundays, we, this is our assembly Bible study. We do teach on Wednesday, but it's videoed. And it's accessed through Doctrinal Studies Bible Church. And here we are in Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama, coming to you from our 930 service. In last week's lesson, if you recall, we introduced Elijah's misguided zeal and authority. After winning a great victory by the Lord God of Israel on Mount Carmel, he told the Israelites to murder 850 prophets of Baal. By doing this, Elijah killed the spiritual reformation that God had set up after three and a half years of drought, which was designed to bring a spiritual awakening to those with positive volition. By this one single act, Elijah killed the hope of reuniting the 12 tribes of Israel into a one nation government again. What I'm trying to show you is how much of the plan of God rides on our daily choices. I mean, you didn't learn all this Bible doctrine just to flow through to eternity. And you have no idea how your single day decisions impact the future that God has you connected to. Elijah didn't, and he was the prophet. I mean, he understood when he put 12 stones down there that it was God's desire to have a one priest nation. But he didn't act it, he didn't act in the spiritual realm in a way to bring that about. In fact, he killed it. And so we want to take serious thought about this stuff that we're in, this virus that we're in. The sad story about the life of Elijah is the failure resulted in another 150 years of a divided kingdom and a mess of idolatry. These 10 tribes will disappear from biblical history until the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
Think about that. They had destined. They were part of the destiny of Christ. The 12 tribes were one to be one in Christ. Just like the church. We're so divided in the church. We got all these denominations and yet it's difficult to become one mind in Christ. You would think we could have it because we only have one Bible. But we have so many misinterpretations and different interpretations. And out of it comes all these different forms of, of denominations or governing rules. See, every denomination is like a government. And there's no single authority structure. Everybody does what their own wind. We've got a mess in the church of Jesus Christ because the Bible shouldn't be divided that way into governing authorities. There is only one governing authority, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church, the Savior of the body. How do we expect to win our neighbors? How do we expect to win the world with this division? Just like Israel was divided, they were divided. I mean, how bad is that? And here God wants them reunited, wants, it, wants to do it now. They're into the, listen, they're into the eighth king and God wants it done now. He's, he's made an appeal with every king. And nobody will listen. They've just bought into idolatry and throw God under the bus. And now he's set up in the eighth. Listen, there's going to be 20 kings. And the eighth king, he wanted a spiritual reformation. And part of that was to get under a one... Listen, do you know what government Israel was under? A theocracy. Listen, you can have many... Israel had different forms. They had judges and monarchy. But the government was a theocracy. The theocracy had different forms. Yet it was a theocracy. It was run by God. And everybody from the king to the prophets to the people knew that if they read the Bible. If they read their law, they were so proud of. But, you know, Satan is a crafty guy. <laughs> If you spend any time fighting in the angelic colony, you'll find out he is really tricky. He plays dirty. He talks sweet and fights dirty. And uh, when you think you're on top of your game, you're probably not. <laughs> you're probably not. Hello, Elijah. Elijah. Well, within 150 years, these 10 tribes will disappear completely from human history, and they had a chance to be a part of it all the way to the coming of Christ, first and second. Don't miss this great opportunity to impact the world with your life. Elijah came from nowhere, and he went to nowhere. And for all practical purposes, he was nobody except for what God called him to be. You're going to find him disappear. Except for the record of how we should live for God. Well, today's lesson, we're going to continue. This is part two of what we started with. I, today, we'll give five additional aspects of Elijah's misguided zeal and authority. I'm going to drop you ahead to chapter 19 coming previews or previews of coming attractions. I'm going to drop you over to chapter 19, verse 10, when Elijah tells you this. Now, I'm in chapter 19. Listen to what he said. 
He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of armies. See, sometimes we forget even what we're praying about and who, to whom. Was I, Elijah in any fight that God couldn't win? Not if he's the Lord of hosts, if he's the Lord of the, of the army. I mean, no matter how bad your battle gets in life, you still have the Lord of the host on your side, do you not? Peter pulled one sword. Jesus said, listen, I could have called, what, 12 legions of angels. It only took two to take care of Sodom and Gomorrah. Imagine what <laughs> Your fight is never, your struggle in life and fight in life is never greater than what God is equipped to do for you on his behalf. Elijah prays that prayer and he says, I, want to th I, 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 I am very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel, there's a finger pointing, but it's okay, it's true. This finger pointing. If he talks about what their failure was and never about his own, too much zeal will do that. The sons of Israel have forsaken the covenant. They have forsaken covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left. Was that true? <laughs> Listen, even if it was, are you ever alone? Well, wait a minute. I got maybe one or two people believe that. This whole church ought to believe that. You know why? Because God said, I never leave you nor forsake you. You need to read Hebrews 13. You should always remember when you, the way you conduct your life, you're never alone. Well, you say, what, you know, what happens in my house stays in my house. Come to my house, my house. Yeah. Let me tell you, you're never alone. Now, do you like this idea of God never leaves nor forsakes you? <laughs> huh? How do you like that idea? And listen, sometimes what's done behind, behind doors, God makes it public. He did with David and Bathsheba. I'm just saying, sometimes you love these scriptures and yet you don't practice them. You live with somebody and treat them like a dog in private and teach and Treat them like a champion dog in public. Now I'll tell you, you're never alone in it. Besides, God never leaves nor forsake you. You have the Holy Spirit. He's got his hands full. Because you won't listen to him. I've been very zealous. I alone am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Think they can, you think that anybody has the power to take your life from you? Government, foreign powers. You think anybody has the power to take the life of God away from you? Do you believe that? Well, then you need to get on a page with the word of God because that ain't true. You have been sealed unto the day of redemption. Sealed is a, is, a, is a factor of God. The Holy Spirit indwells you, John 14, 16, and, kiss, and cannot leave you and will not leave you. You don't fear what man can do. You, if you fear, listen, it's not the hands of man that you should fear. It's the hands of God you should fear.
I don't know. Here's point number one. Once Elijah's part in the Mount Carmel, in Mount Carmel victory, once his part was done, his ministry phase of moving the priest nation from spiritual weakness to spiritual reformation was completed at this point. He had successfully done what he had been called to do. Now he must wait, unfortunately for him, like all of us, we hate waiting, especially Americans. We don't like to wait for nothing. It's no wonder we have a problem with wait on the Lord. <laughs> I mean, even if wait on the Lord meant to serve him, we would still be impatient. Well, when is he ever going to sit down? When is he ever going to shut up? How am I going to get this to him? Why ain't he drinking his coffee? We're most impatient people. I am. I work on it every day of my life. Now he must wait for a next assignment regarding the spiritual reformation because there's some business that has to be done by the king before Elijah can get his next assignment. And so we're told in Psalms 27, 14, wait for the Lord. How do I wait? Be strong and let your heart take courage. That's how you wait. Yes, I said, wait for the Lord. <laughs> wait for the Lord. You know, that can be a tough thing. It's been tough on me. I wanted, I wanted out of this area so bad, I can't begin to do it for 25 years, at least for 25 years. This is not the geographic place. but I've had to learn to be patient. Listen, not only is it difficult for me, it's difficult for Yankees. If you don't believe it, go visit New York or go to my home state, Michigan. My, my. It was now a matter of waiting on King Ahab and the Lord God of Israel to rid the nation of idolatry and the prophets of Baal. Whichever God, either Baal or the God of Israel, the Lord God, who won, won win or take all, right? Win or take all. We're into winner take all before he can get another assignment. It now falls on the office of the king, not the office of the prophet. And listen, everybody that went to Mount Carmel for this great contest had no doubt in their minds when that day, contest was over that God won it hands down. <laughs> He won it hands down, whatever, whatever that phrase is, hands down. I guess hands, hands down. The divine chain of command of authority in the priest nation of Israel goes from the Lord God to the king, which is a, a monarchy form at this time of a theocracy government. Romans, the 13th chapter, verse 1 reminds us as the church of Jesus Christ, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authority. Now, he doesn't tell you what kind. That's going to become a surprise to you. It doesn't matter what form. Do you understand that? Oh, you have your choices. Yeah, I understand that. But he's going to give you what he's going to give you. And you're to be subjective to it. Every person is to be subjected to the governing authority. 
for there is no authority except from God. And those who exist are established by God. Read Romans 13. You're going to need it if this election goes wrong. This election is for the future of America and the direction is going. Because, listen, they're going to take your Constitution away. If the other side wins, they're going to take your Constitution away, your Bill of Rights. And then when, when they change all that, they're going to come after all the other freedoms that you have. The freedom pro to protect your life and your family's life and all these other things. Your property. All that is constitutional of this existing government. And you ought to know by now in this election that they're hell bound to take it away. They make no bones about it. If you've been paying attention, you ought to know they make no bones about it. They're the mo this is the first time in my life listening to politics that the, the, the enemy has come out bold against us. We can win this, but it's got to come spiritual. Listen, politics didn't win Mount Carmel. Politics led to it. Legislation didn't win it. Legislation lost it. That's why there's idolatry in Israel. It was won by the spiritual Elijah went in there and did exactly what God told him to do and did it exactly as God told him to do it until it came down to usurping authority away from the king. Now it has become a matter of King Ahab and the Lord God of Israel to rid the nation of idolatry and the prophets of Baal. The divine chain of command of authority in the priest nation goes from the Lord God to the king. Note the word subjection in our passage I read, Romans, is hupotasso. It's a, divine, it's a, a subjection to a divine setup. God sets it up. And it applies to everything. It applies to freedom. It applies to marriage. It applies to all the divine institutions. Hupotasso is the key word. Wives, be sub submissive to your husband's children. Be submissive to your parents. Yada, 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 yada. Citizens, be subjective to the governing authority. It's hupotasso. That's the key. Hupotasso is required no matter what form of government. You've got to get it in your head because if this election doesn't go the way you should vote for a real tomorrow that will not bring a whole new government change, you're going to have to, uh, you're going to, have to read and bleed Romans 13. You might as well get ahead of the game. You still got two months. And if you're not registered to vote, shame on you. If you're an American, shame on you. Register to vote, stand in line and vote. My, my, if you don't think this is critical, if this is not critical in our life, I don't know what. You can kiss this republic goodbye. You can kiss the former government. They'll dismantle that. They, think how hard these peace people for the last 25 years have been trying to dismantle the Constitution of the United States of America. They've, they've gone the back door, the front door, the side door. They've chopped a hole in the ceiling. I don't know. If you, if you need more evidence than that, you're going to find the enemy knock on your door. Now God will hold King Ahab responsible and deal with him directly. And I'll tell you, who, whoever wins this election, 
if Trump wins this election, he's got to become submissive to God who overrules, and he's got to clean our nation up. None of this political gobbledygook, and no, I don't have but four years. In other words, there's two sides to this. If he wins, he's got to clean it up. And that's going to be a mess. The deep state is nothing compared to what we have going on in our nation after 25 years. But he's got to clean it up. His government is under the office of God, and he's got to clean it up. And he needs to do it because he holds the office of, of president. I'm not talking about a spiritual person. I'm talking about Ahab wasn't, and he was told to clean it up. And God is going to hold him accountable. If Trump wins, God is going to hold him accountable to clean our nation up. And how difficult is that going to be, huh? I can't believe that you don't understand all this anarchy is going on. It's to persuade the voter to vote against the Constitution and the Bill of Rights of America. I'm telling you because this is what's going on in Israel in our passage. The reason I chose this time to teach what I'm teaching is because it's so parallel. Now God will hold King Ahab responsible and deal with him directly. This was true with the priest nation of Israel. It's also true with client nations. If you don't believe that, you should read the story of Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. And you should read spe specifically the fourth chapter of Daniel, 28 through 37. And when God, God deals directly with a nation, he expects that man to pay attention to him or he will put him in a bunch of hurt. You should read it. Mr. Trump should read it. Well... I don't have any authority with Mr. I don't have the ear of the president. I'm not sure I even have yours. Hopefully I do. That's always my hopeful. Point number two, the governing authority of the nation, watch this, the governing authority, not, no government exists without God. Do you got that? Oh my goodness, you got to read Romans 13 and get it in your soul. You're going to need it. Either way this election goes, you're going to need it. You need to know that the governing authority of a nation is a minister of God for good and praise as well as for evil and the sword. Romans 13 again. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior. You know who's an example of that? Joseph. Rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but they are for evil. Joseph. Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Esther. The Bible is full of examples for us to understand. The, Paul goes on in Romans 13. Do you want to have no fear of authority? <laughs> Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God. That's with a capital G, Bubba. The existing government is a minister of God. To you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. 
for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. This applies to every form of government. You know, Romans is written under Roman rule. The church at Rome was under Roman rule. And he's writing to them about how to conduct themselves under foreign rule. A Caesar system. Note government is an avenger. Notice this word ek, that's the preposition, and dikos is from dike, justice. Is an avenger of justice and mercy. As a minister of God. Don't forget that. The government is an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil and praise on the one who does good. In 1 Kings 19, we will see Jezebel, preview of coming attractions, we will see Jezebel attempting to do this against Elijah. Here's evil. Evil attacks good by calling it evil. <laughs> evil attacks good by calling it evil. That's what the anarchists are out in our streets doing today. Burning everything down. My, 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 who would ever believe this happened in America? And who would imagine you would allow it? What kind of people govern a group of people and give them consent to burn the place down? My, my, my. America. Pay attention to the color of these states. Evil always calls good evil so it can attack it. Jezebel will do that. Jezebel will do it. She'll get after him, boy. She will get after him. Does she have any authority? Was, does she have any authority under God? Is she part of the government? Nah. All she's got is demonic sex with the king. Apparently it's pretty powerful. <laughs> but it's not more powerful than God. She'll find that out the hard way. Point number three. Elijah used his position of spiritual authority to punish violators of criminal law. I don't know why I'm hollering. I'm just, I'm so disgusted with what's going on in America today. I can hardly be civil myself. <laughs> I have just tore up over it. I'm trying to do my part from the pulpit. I'll do it at the ballot box for sure. Elijah used his position as spiritual authority to punish violators of criminal law of idolatry. That's not his deal. God didn't call him to do that. He called him to preach the word and the gospel. God put Ahab in charge. And God is going to hold him responsible directly. And boy, does God hold him. Read that about Nebuchadnezzar if you don't think God can hold you accountable. And listen, that's just one of many stories in the Bible. But it's a good one. It's a good one. It depends on what side you're on. It's a good one. You should read passages like Exodus 2, 18 and 20. You should read Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, where God tells you very clear in the Ten Commandments how he feels about idolatry 
and, and not making him number one in your life. He's a, he's a, he's a jealous God. And he's so jealous, he never leaves you alone. And that's a good thing. The one thing you can count on, you'll never be left alone. I don't know how many widows I've sat and held their hand and told them that. What am I going to do? I'm all alone. You are never all alone. <laughs> don't listen to the devil tell you you're alone. You're never alone. That's a good thing. You should read Leviticus 21 through 8. You should read Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 22. Ahab should have read the law of the five cycles of divine discipline on a nation. He has the book of Deuteronomy, which was kept in the Ark of the Covenant. He understands the importance of the book of Deuteronomy. And that book is going to hold him accountable with God. King Ahab allowed Jezebel to violate the criminal law of idolatry. And the Israelites participated in it by joining it. He allowed her not only to bring idolatry, which is a, a, a capital punishment law, you do that, you, can, you could have died in Israel for doing that. And if you participated in it, you could die there. And the people believe that the government has authority over their life and death. Listen, the truth of the matter is they don't have power over your life nor your death because God does. And he never puts you through anything that is not beneficial for the kingdom of God. My, my, my. Has he not squeezed your life hard enough for you to know that? Boy, is mine. If he keeps squealing my I was scream bloody murder. I can tell you that. Listen, Father, I am so happy to be a part of your program. I speak it publicly. However, Ahab, to fix the mess he's created will be a job, but it will be his to fix. It is not the prophet's job to fix the government. It's to fix the people, not the government. You know, the prophet has the ear of the people. John the Baptist had the ear of the people, not the leadership. And the leadership killed him. But he had the voice of the people because he was the voice for God crying in the wilderness. And listen, your ministry is always in the wilderness. Mine has always been in the wilderness. A voice crying in the wilderness. Is anybody listening to me? That's a voice in the wilderness. Listen, I'm going to, I have come to understand that I preach this for God. I preach it for God, to God. If nobody else wants it, I am obligated to still continue that until my last breath. At some point in your ministry, you will come to understand the importance of being the voice of God in the wilderness. Well, it is the office of king and government and criminal law, book of Deuteronomy, that's got to clean this mess up. And, and listen, God will clean it up quicker than it started. Actually, it was Jezebel who violated the criminal law by the failing cult of Baal worship and murdering the prophets of God of Israel. She got away with all that. You can't let them get away with that. She got away with all of that. And now the Israelites are a mess. When you become a lawless society, 
You're a mess to clean up. And we have a start to be a lawless, and they've given you an example of what's to come. And they'll burn your place down until you submit. It's called persecution, and it's coming. It's already here in some places, and you should be praying on those blue states where this anarchy is going. Let me tell you, the devil will target the believers like crazy. If you don't know this group has been out against Christianity, your head's been buried in the sand. We used to talk about the martyrs for Christ as something foreign. <laughs> uh, not anymore. The Israelites were also guilty by saying nothing and engaging in it, idolatry. The only voice publicly of objection was the prophet Elijah and God who sent a three and a half year drought. Is that not a strong voice? <laughs> three and a half years of this. Imagine getting three and a half years of what we've got. The government we got. Mm. Well, you should read John the Baptist sometime this week. Read John, John the third chapter and John the 14th chapter. See how the government feels about a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Uh, you might as well get prepared for that one too. As the prophet to the nation, Elijah's responsibility was to teach the truth of the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ in order to equip the Israelites with the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, 11 through 13, not on your paper, and Ephesians 6, 10 through 17 on your paper, and you should read Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 22. Now let me close. Point number four. The Lord God of Israel had already won the victory the Lord God of Israel, the, nobody else won that war on Mount Car Car uh, Carmel but him, did it, right? That was the deal. The Lord God of Israel had already won the victory over idolatry of Baal worship on Mount Carmel. Now we are ready for a spiritual reformation in Israel once the king moves. It is now the king's responsibility to take charge. The king has got to move the sons of Israel along the political scheme and deal with the prophets of Baal in order to give Elijah a second assignment to carry the spiritual reformation forward. All who attended the contest on Mark Carmel understood the complete victory of winner take all, which was the Lord God of Israel. Now it is up to King Ahab to select the manner of ridding the Israelites of Baal worship that God would approve. I mean, he's got to read it. He's got to see what God's put in the law. And then he's got to do, pick the right options and, and have, have the approval of God. And listen, it would normally not be difficult, except he's let a mess be created. He allowed a mess to grow into a bigger mess. Now he's got a mess to clean up. But listen, it can be cleaned up, and it must be cleaned up. And it is his responsibility to do it. It falls under his office of responsibility. While the victory was, was, was political and legal for King Ahab, for Elijah it was spiritual. Look, when, 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 God, when the victory was won by God on Mount Carmel, for Ahab, 
That was a political victory. It was a legal victory. He's a king. He's not a prophet. He's a king. And now he has the full weight of God publicly demonstrated behind him to make the choices politically and legally. Do you understand that? Oh, please tell me you understand that. If there was one guy that understood that God Almighty... Listen, there's two offices there that are necessary for a spiritual reformation. There is the government and there is the, there is the prophet. One's political and legal and one is spiritual. And they both understood what a great victory God Almighty had done. And Elijah took it upon himself with misguided uh, zeal to do something that was not his responsibility. He usurped the authority from God and the king. My, my, my. By now, tell me you begin to understand this. Now it is up to King Ahab to select the manor and rid the nation of Baal worship. Elijah was God's mouthpiece for the word of God. You remember, you remember 1 Kings 17, 24? Circle that and read that later. Because that widow of Zarephath said it just the way it should be said. This was the man Elijah was. He was a man of the word of God. He, he was a man of the truth of the word of God. And when you met him, you knew it. That's his... That's his office. That's what he's responsible for. He's not responsible for the prophets of Baal. He's not responsible for idolatry. It is the nation. Listen, Ahab allowed it in, and Ahab has got to clean it up. It falls under the office of the king, and he's held directly responsible by God. And it bothers me that Elijah did that. It bothers me any time that I see the man who's been called to be the champion of the word of God and evangelist get into the foolishness of politics and legality. That's the one thing I loved about working with Billy Graham. The one thing I loved about Billy Graham, he stayed to office of what his call was God. He stayed. They tried to get him in everything possible. He always went to the gospel of Jesus. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? What do you think about this? You know what he did? It didn't matter what he said. What do you think about the rain today? I think the gospel is what's important to people's life. Well, what do you think about the wind? I think what's important to people today is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's Elijah's task. I wonder, I wonder when I think of this story, how many soul of Tarsus could be in the prophets of Baal? When I read Galatians 1, 11 through 17, one of those guys could have been Saul of Tarsus for sure because he was there under Israel's flag persecuting the church of Jesus Christ out of misguided zeal and authority. When you want to read Paul's testimony, and you ought to read it every once in a while, especially during this session, read Acts 9, 22 and 26 because he lays out his testimony in a wonderful way. You can read Galatians 1 and Philippians 2 and get more of it. The problem with the church of Jesus Christ today is they're spiritually lazy. They don't read their Bible. They don't read it for their life. Maybe to get a, a check mark that says, oh, I just read a whole chapter. Now I, I get a star. You ought to have, listen, you ought to read it for life-changing stuff. The Bible is for transformation. Your life ought to be being transformed into the will of God away from conformity to the world, Romans 12, 2. How many Saul of Tarsus, Gary Horton, or Ron Adam are in that group? They should have an opportunity having seen the almighty God work in such a marvelous way, they ought to have the opportunity to make a choice, don't you think? <laughs> K 
kill me? At least give, let me get a chance to see God work some way or another so I can have an option. I don't have any choices. These guys didn't get any choice. You say, well, they're prophets of Baal. So what? Saul of Tarsus was, come on. Look what he did as a champion through his salvation for God. See, I think about stuff like that. I listened to Paul's testimony in chapter 22 of Acts, verse 3 and 4. Strictly, according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as all are today, I persecuted this way to death. Je Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It became, uh, it became a symbol, like the cross is today. The way became a symbol. I persecuted this way to death, bringing, binding, and putting both men and women into prison. What a, what a wonderful opportunity to be able to be in a different place in your life and look back and say, what, what a marvelous work of grace did God do in my life, and he can do it in yours. And when he was speaking to King Agrippa, he was trying to tell him, listen, don't stay in the mess you're in. Come over. Get your life cleaned up by the blood of Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, to get you out of conformity to the world that will suck your life right out of your life, put you in a pig pen to let you die with pigs. God wants to bring you out of that and restore you in the fullness of his grace, and he will do it by his great mercy and love, not by your effort or your zeal, but by the grace and mercy and love of God. Let us pray. Well, our Heavenly Father, we're going to preach from the housetops. They put us in prison, we'll preach it in prison. We'll preach it in the cave till the day we die. There is no other way to God except through Jesus Christ. He is the way and the truth and the life. That is my prayer today, Father, for America and for the rest of the world. All who are under the virus, all these nations under the virus, I pray they will hear this message and understand the responsibility. Come to Jesus. He will give you life. He will take death and give you life. He will take your sin and give you his righteousness. He will take your sin and give you his righteousness. We're so thankful for it, Father. How can we possibly express our gratitude for the life we've had in America? Father, it's been a magnificent grace, mercy ride. And now we're in the battle of our life to sustain it for our, our children and our grandchildren and their children and grandchildren. And here's where, the, here's where the pivot must come and rise and speak the truth to their neighbor and preach the gospel to them for they'll never understand it apart from the light of Christ in their soul. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.